Tonight, I'm going to talk about the ministry for the future and COP26 and what I have learned since COP26 is it's um, a fire hose of information, as we all know, and now a lot of it's getting aimed my way by a kind of a category error because I am an English major and a science fiction writer, and um, that's all I am. So if somebody is actually coming to me to find solutions for climate change, then we're in terrible trouble. Um, and it's worried me a lot, um, but I'm beginning to see uh, things that I can do even as the cardboard cutout for the minister for the future. I was at um, Glasgow inside the Blue Zone. My hangout was the UN Futures Lab when they were my home base, my, my buddies, they took care of me, they gave me a closet to sleep in if I had to take a nap, and they taught me things. And, they, and, and I was really quite comfortable there, and it was a tremendous education. And at one point, my, my main host, a, a woman named Coco Warner, who's worked at every one of the cops for the UN, she said, Stan, who invited you here? And I thought it was her. And I was looking at her going, oh my God, I don't know anything. I don't even know why I'm here. Uh, and I had to investigate. I had to pretend. I looked at her and I said, um, well, the invocation came from Nigel Topping, whose official title was the High Champion for COP26, because the British government likes their titles a lot. The High Champion was his official title, a good guy, and he was the one who invited me. And he gave me a red pass, which meant that in the Blue Zone, I could go anywhere I wanted. And this wasn't true for most people who were observers. You would get a yellow badge, and you wouldn't go into the negotiating sessions. That was for people with red or blue, and blue was just the UN itself. So there I was with this red badge, which Nigel Topping had given me. And I decided that the rest of the thing being a kind of a trade show for each nation would buy a pavilion in a giant convention center. And I, I don't know if you all have seen pictures of the Blue Zone in a cop, but it's somewhat like a trade show or a circus or a, um, um, it's, or a science fiction convention. And anybody who knows science fiction conventions, uh, one of those for two days is not bad. For two weeks, you have got to be kidding me. Um, and yet, so I began to go to negotiating sessions, any kind of negotiating session. And this is very interesting. They were more than 50% women in their 30s and 40s. Lawyers, diplomats, scientists. They were working a document. They were editing together. They were revising, editing, um, proposing. In th this is one kind of session anyway. Document editing um, by a, a ferociously concentrated, cheerful but meticulous, um, uh, from my point of view, young women and with some elderly Brit diplomats who were staggering around with a limp and a briefcase from Bretton Woods. And it was, it was very cute how uh, calm they were compared to uh, the, everybody else there. Um, and I was impressed by that. And then in other negotiating sessions, in, in a very polite tones of voice, people were arguing over money. And the developed world was holding back their bags of money. And the developing world was saying, you promised it and we need it. And in polite voices, you were seeing the incredible tight-fistedness, the self-destructive tight-fistedness of all of the developed countries who had promised money in the Paris Agreement and aren't coughing it up. One of the developing nations diplomats said to me, the, the sewage budget for New York City is $35 billion a year, and the developed world has just given us 20 billion when they promised 100 billion, and even 100 billion is uh, not enough, but 20 billion is ridiculous, and that's where they were at. So this was a depressing part of Glasgow for sure, but to see it all happen real time, I began to understand COP is just a place to come and look at each other on an annual basis to see what we're doing in the rest of the world the rest of the year. It is not the place of solving problems. It's, there's no legally binding treaties there, and there's no sheriff nor a jail if you were to break the promises or even to leave the agreement outright. Um, it has some beautiful mechanisms in it. It has an injunction to permanently improve each time they meet, 
Everybody's supposed to up their promises and make things better. And so it's like a ratchet or a come along. Each year you ratchet up the um, intensity of the promises, but they're promises only. And I began to think, it's like a marriage. This is what you got to think of it as. You promised to spend your whole life together and to do productive things together. Five years later, you break up. Nobody throws you in jail, um, hopefully. And, and so what you got at this point is a world in which all the nation states have, in effect, joined into a, a, a group marriage or, a, or something like a marriage, a set of promises to behave in certain ways together. And there's no place to move if you get a divorce. It's like one of those stories from my, my, my Soviet agent during the USSR days. He and his wife had divorced 10 years before, but they were still in the same apartment. Well, the world's going to be like that. We can't get away from each other. And there's, we got, I'm going to come back to talking about the nation-state system. So I'm, everybody, I guess the last things I would say about COP, well, there's a, a few observations. It was a militarized site, so the UK government was really worried because of world leaders coming or because of Seattle 1999. Um, it was behind barbed wire and tank stoppers. The, it was on the River Clyde so that there were Zodiacs out on the river with um, military people and machine guns. There were helicopters just hovering oftentimes, especially during the marches. And the Scottish people were loving their marches. Um, I stood next to Bill McKibben as the start of one march. We were like at the parade marshals, you know, oh, off you go, off you go. And they were seeing McKibben, who's very recognizable, going, oh my God, you know, it's St. Bill is blessing this march. And they had taken their kids out of school, out of preschool. It was a family affair. Everybody had made banners and posters. It's quite beautiful. Um, 10,000 people on Friday, 100,000 people on Saturday, and about 100 people in a, in a non-sanctioned march where there were many more police than there were marchers. And I joined all three of them. Um, but the, I have to admit that the big one on Saturday, I only joined them because I needed to cross the street. And there was no other way. And so I went out there and I joined a group of nurses and we chatted for a while and I flowed downstream for about 100 yards or so and then got off on the other side and went my way. Um, but it was quite beautiful to see the civic engagement of the Scottish people with uh, being the hosts of COP. And then the results from it were good as far as they go. But every diplomat and scientist there, the more they knew about the COP system in the world, the more scared they were. Because although it is an admirable system and way better than nothing at all, it's too slow because it's built on a consensus model. Every nation there has to agree to every sentence. You saw an example of this in the last hours, where they were going to phase out coal. And at the last moment, China and India, and several other nations, said, um, um, oh gosh, we can't do that. Um, we, we, we refuse. And they went into a huddle and, over time, a couple hours of intense lobbying, and they came out, well, we'll phase down coal. And then everybody signed off on it. Well, this kind of consensus model, although admirable, it's like the General Assembly without the Security Council. So it's a true uh, international body of nations. You've got all the people there, but since they have to all agree to every statement, um, as admirable as it is, it's too slow compared to the crisis. I, w I reckoned on the train ride down to London that if we had... This is such a guess, but it's a science fiction exercise. If we had 40 years, COP procedures might work, but we only have 10. So they're not enough. And, we're, and, and, we, and I left COP thinking, we are in terrible trouble. And nothing in the four months since then has made me change my mind on that. We are in terrible trouble. But that doesn't mean... What that means also needs to be unpacked. So... Um, in the months since then, I thought it would slack off. It didn't slack off. And I began to get quite nervous about being helpless to suggest or say anything. But what I began to realize is I could take somebody um, uh, who were, was interested in talking to me about topic X, and I could connect them up with somebody else who was an expert on topic X. And they didn't know about each other because the world is too big. And that's interesting in and of itself that... Although there's lots of good work being done, not only is there no coordinating force that's making priorities and, and linking things up together and all that, but that's almost impossible 
in the in the world that we're in, who would do that? I'm involved with the UN's 50-year forecasting group, and the UN is doing their damnedest to maybe rate and prioritize. They're overwhelmed. They can't do it. You would have to postulate a, a, a minister for the future that was a really good budget uh, and, uh, and a huge team of people trying to sort and connect, and that doesn't really exist. But as my cardboard cutout imitation of a minister, I can now begin to connect people who should know about each other. Just recently, I met the woman who runs California's 30 by 30 program, 30% 30 of California protected land for wild creatures by the year 2030. Amazing idea. And I thought it would never happen in my lifetime. And already they're shooting for 2030. And, and they say, well, after we hit 30 by 30, we're going to shoot for 50 by 50. And then we'll have a healthy biosphere. And California is an exemplary space, as you know, and teaches the rest of the world how to do these things. And the rest of the world teaches California. It's a super promising thing. But she had never met the head of the Pacific Conservation League, which without this 30 by 30 framework had nevertheless been working on similar causes for the last uh, 25 years. And I was able to say, oh gosh, you need, you know, you're both in the Sacramento area, you need to meet. They've since met, it's a productive meeting, things will go on. Uh, it's been a pleasure for me. And when I was talking with this Jennifer Norris, head of 30 by 30, what we began to discover together is you need the framework tale, the frame tale. Because everybody's individual efforts are going to be too small to matter or to change the world. And you do what you can, and you're thinking, well, I'm, I'm swimming again, I'm crossing the Pacific by swimming, I'm in terrible trouble here, uh, because it's such a small drop in the bucket or drop in the ocean. But if you see that you're part of a larger story where everybody else is also putting, say, another analogy, a brick in the wall, you work on your brick, you know there's a wall, you'll stick your brick into it. This is a crucial realization for keeping spirits up. Solidarity, mutual aid. And it's funny when you think about this wall analogy. For one thing, I build my walls in Maine out of glacial cobble. It's the worst possible rock to make walls out of. Hilariously bad, and every, every spring I go out there with my wife and find my last year's wall has fallen down just from the freeze and thaw cycle um, and gravity. Um, and that's the kind of material we have, right? And also, there's no architect, and there's no stonemason. But nevertheless, this is how um, group projects work. Um, everybody knows what needs to be built, and so you just put your brick in the wall, and you feel that the concept of the wall is helping. So I think that that's another reason why Ministry for the Future has had, people had a hunger for that story that if everything that is possible to be done gets done, then even the bad stuff won't be able to stop us from getting to a good place. Mm -hmm.